evening. You're watching the Southern University System President's VChat, a live online video conversation with Dr. Ronald Mason, Jr. I'm Robin Merrick, Director of Alumni Affairs for the Southern University System and Executive Director of the Southern University Alumni Federation. I want to welcome all of our alumni, our students, our faculty, stakeholders, and friends to our sixth live VChat conversation with the SU System President. We appreciate your participation and we look forward to an informative session to highlight the many things going on throughout the Southern University system at this time. As you may be aware, higher education in Louisiana is facing potential budget cuts. So joining Dr. Mason this evening as his special guest will be Dr. Leon Tarver, the chairman of the Southern University Board of Supervisors and Louisiana Commissioner of Higher Education with the Board of Regents, Dr. Joseph Rollo. Thank you to all of you who have joined us this evening and have emailed your questions. We have them in hand. So before we begin with Dr. Mason's presentation, I'd like to remind everyone that you can still email questions to us for tonight's vChat at vchat at sus.edu. That is vchat at sus. While we will not be able to get to all of the questions this evening that come in, Please know that every question will be answered. We'll take that up with you at a later date via email. So we want to thank you for your presence this evening and your input. And we're about ready to start the conversation. And we'll turn it over to our system president, Dr. Ronald Mason. Dr. Mason. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you again. Welcome to our live VChat, uh, where we bring you up to speed on issues that are important to you and exciting things that are going on at the Southern University and AM College system. Uh, first, let me wish you a happy Mardi Gras. You know, here it's Mardi Gras season, and most of our folks are in or from Louisiana. Uh, Mardi Gras is next Tuesday, so we've had many Mardi Gras celebrations with the alumni associations around the, uh, the uh, country. I know there was one in Chicago, and there was one in Houston. I wasn't able to make those, but I did make the one in Washington, D.C. Had a great time, uh, and just for future reference, I generally go to whoever asked me first. Uh, so Washington asked me first this year, and they asked me first last year, so that's why I ended up going there this year. Uh, but, um, you know, get to me early next time, and I'll be sure to come and join you for your Mardi Gras celebration. Uh, we do have uh, an exciting um, um, uh, V-chat this afternoon, this evening, and we have some very exciting guests as well. We have the Commissioner of Higher Education, Dr. Joseph Rallo, who uh, recently joined the Board of Regents. Uh, he's going to talk to us about what's happening in higher education and the many challenges that we're going to be facing over the course of the next few months. Uh, and first up is going to be Dr. Leon Tarver, an emeritus of uh, the Southern University and AM College system and recently elected chairman of the board. Uh, he's going to introduce you uh, to the names of some of the new board members that have come on board of late, as well as uh, talk uh, about some issues that uh, we'll be facing in the Southern University system in the near future. Uh, so that's an introduction from me. I'll be back to you to give you some more details about uh, other matters and answer some questions that you may have. But for now, I'm going to hand it back over to Robin so she can get you to Dr. Tarver. Robin? Thank you, Dr. Mason, for that introduction. Of course, it has been indeed a busy season for the Southern University alumni family. And, and of course, we have had a busy season in the Southern University Alumni Federation thus far this semester. Uh, lots of events going on around the country, as Dr. Mason said, so that means a lot of alumni engagement. We're going to turn it over right now to Dr. Leon Tarver II. He is the chairman of the Southern University Board of Supervisors. He's in the Board of Supervisors office right now, so many of you know that the VChat, we are very remote here, so we're going to turn it over to the, the system uh, board's office right now. Dr. Tarver. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Merrick and to uh, Dr. Mason, Dr. Rallo, and to our great listening audience, uh, our Southern University alums and supporters. Uh, this year is an exciting year for us, but it's also one of the most challenging years that we face at this uh, system uh, in a very long time. Uh, almost everyone now has learned about the impact of the uh, budget cuts uh, intended for higher education, and uh, Dr. Rallo is going to speak uh, to that later on, but needless to say, it certainly has uh, potential impacts for our university system and our, our four or five campuses. Uh, but I want to uh, share a word with you about uh, our Board of Supervisors. As you know, the Board of Supervisors uh, has some 16 board members, uh, including students selected by student SGA presidents. 
and now I'm having difficulty talking and listening at the same time, but I'll continue by saying that uh, we recently had added five new board members uh, to the Board of Supervisors. There were five members who served out that terms of office. What's it called? And I want to share with you the names of those five uh, people because they are very loyal and dedicated uh, members uh, of the board, and we uh, have great expectations of their participation over the next six years of their terms in office. Uh, the first among those is uh, Reverend Donald Henry of Gonzales, uh, who is a very enthusiastic uh, graduate of Southern University uh, and uh, brings a great deal of energy, insight, uh, a lot of determination. Uh, to help change the face of our university and to improve the quality of education and services to our students and to our faculty, as well as the communities at large across the state and around the nation. Uh, the second member is attorney Pat McGee. And many of you may know Mr. McGee. Uh, he has been on the board before. He's from the great city of Lafayette. Uh, and he returns to the board at this time. And we're looking forward to his participation uh, to take advantage of the years of experience and knowledge uh, and wit that he brings to the environment. And we believe he will continue to make great contributions to the future of our university system. The next is uh, Dr. Kerman Gaines, uh, newest member too from the great city of Alexandria. Uh, Dr. Dr. Gaines is also a graduate of Southern University. Uh, coming from central Louisiana, he hopes to be able to spread the word of Southern University in his homeland uh, because he wants to be able to increase the enrollment of students uh, in that region uh, to Southern University. And so we're looking forward to the many gains. He's a former uh, school superintendent in the state of uh, Minnesota. And so we welcome him back to his home state and uh, look forward to his participation on our Board of Supervisors. The next uh, is perhaps the youngest of our, uh, uh, our board members, uh, Dr. Ronnie Whitfield. Uh, Dr. Whitfield is a young man who's grown up in this environment almost all of his life. He, both of his parents uh, worked at Southern University. Uh, and he brings a great deal of insight, a lot of energy for his youthfulness, uh, and a lot of dedication. He's been certainly one of the uh, young people who has been giving back to this university in a big kind of way. And so we have great expectations of the contributions that he will also make and bring to this university. And last, of course, is a real newcomer uh, from Shreveport, my hometown, uh, Dr. Rick, uh, Mr. Richard uh, Hilliard of Shreveport. Uh, Mr. Hilliard is a Morehouse graduate, but uh, we forgave him for that. We were hoping that he can use some of that uh, talent and skill and know-how uh, that he's acquired at that great school uh, to help us as we develop strategies for the future of our university. Uh, together, these board members are facing great challenges, not only the fiscal challenges, uh, but the fact that we are going through uh, uh, leadership changes, we're going through expansions, we're going through uh, reprogramming, and we're trying to reprioritize uh, not only our spending, but reprioritize the management uh, structure that we have. Uh, as some of you may have heard and know that our next upcoming board meeting, we intend to undertake uh, the, the discussion about uh, merging uh, or consolidating uh, the presidency of the Southern University system and the chancellorship of the Baton Rouge campus in an attempt to uh, eliminate any duplication uh, between those uh, two administrations uh, to save costs, uh, to uh, build a more efficient and more effective uh, organization and to improve the performance uh, standard of, of, of our faculty uh, and staff, uh, to create a more hospitable environment for our students uh, so that we can continue the great legacy of our university has been established since 18, 1880 in New Orleans. So we are looking forward to the future with, uh, with great expectation. And we want to invite you uh, to not only continue to follow what we do, but to continue encouraging us and pushing us to make the right decisions, to do the best thing that we can for our university, for our students, for the communities that we serve uh, throughout this state and across the nation, indeed around the world. And we've been blessed to have so many fine people uh, across the world come to this university, and we would like to make it more well known as we move into the future. So thank you once again for the opportunity to share these few moments and I'll await any questions that may come. Ms. Merrick?
Thank you, Dr. Tarver, for your comments and introducing us to the new board members who are serving from around the state, and we thank them for their service as well. We're going to turn it over now to Dr. Joseph Rallo, who is joining us from the Louisiana Board of Regents. He is the Commissioner of Higher Education. Dr. Rallo is just around the corner. Dr. Rallo, we're going to turn it over to you for a few comments. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mason. Thank you, Dr. Tarver, for the invitation. What I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes uh, talking a little bit about my background and then talk about some uh, trends in higher education, uh, bring those down to Louisiana, including addressing some of the budget issues that, uh, that have already been uh, presented. And then, again, happy to open it up to questions as, as, uh, as appropriate. Um, I grew up in New York City, and uh, I've uh, basically followed two careers over the past 30 plus years. Uh, fortunate to be able to move through a variety of uh, positions at the universities as a tenured business professor, as a dean, as a provost, as a president, and most recently as an assistant vice chancellor at uh, Texas Tech uh, University. And I've really had a lot of experiences from that perspective. When I was a university president, I, was, I served in the, at a Hispanic serving institution and learned a lot about the demographics and expectations and hopes of that student population. The other career path that I followed, I was uh, in the military for 27 years, about 10 years active duty and 17 in the reserves, uh, primarily an intelligence guy, uh, and not intelligent, but intelligence, and uh, retired as a colonel a little while back. And uh, I've always felt that uh, getting back to this country is something that, uh, as a first-generation person, I think is vitally important. So let me talk a little bit about some of the broader trends in higher ed that Louisiana will be part of, and then talk a little bit about Louisiana specifically. Some of the things that are going on nationally is just the entire value proposition of higher education. You know, is a degree worth it? We look at students who are graduating with a high debt burden and underemployment. And we, you know, from our perspective in higher ed, say not only is it important, it's vital to that individual, but also to the society they go back to in terms of civic engagement, community engagement, and giving back to the community. But, but again, that is a conversation that is out there. Uh, the second trend right now is the concept of distance learning. Distance mm -hmm. learning has been around for a while, but uh, a very fine author, Clayton Christensen, who's the Harvard Business School, points out that by 2019, which is quickly approaching, over half the students in high school will have taken most of their courses via distance. So when we to universities, they have certain expectations about how to learn and what they want to learn, and we have to be far more agile in meeting those demands. Third area, the third trend is what we would call competency-based education. And this isn't credit for life experience. It's the ability, for example, to demonstrate competencies either by taking a series of exams or by going through a training program. Let me give you an example. In uh, the Air Force Base in, in Texas is the intelligence school for the Air Force, and young officers go through a six-month program, highly competitive program taught by PhDs in world cultures and world politics, but they get no credit for it. So they come to the university and what we work with them and we say, okay, if you go through that program, we're going to give you six to nine credits toward a graduate program. So it shortens the time to degree completion, but also validates that experience that takes place outside of the classroom. Well, how do we manage those competencies within a higher education environment is a challenge. Another challenge is adults in the workforce or adults uh, rather coming back to the university. The largest demographic right now in the United States are adults, not the 18 to 22-year-old population, but 25 and 30-year-olds who are returning. They have different expectations, different ways of learning, different hopes. So once again, we have to modify how we do things. In Louisiana, let me turn to that a little bit. And these, these trends are all impacting Louisiana, but there's some other things that also are specific to this state. We have as a state a relatively undereducated population. About 50% of the citizens in this state have a high school diploma or less. And that means that as the jobs of the future that are being attracted here to the state emerge, these individuals need to be credentialed. There's a great chart out there that uh, Dr. Sullivan from the Community and Technical Colleges uses that shows that 49 to 50% of the individuals with a high school diploma or less are competing for only 9% of the jobs in the state. The other 81% require a diploma above high school. So one of the challenges is to get these individuals back into the university environment, whether it's the two-year or the four-year. Uh, the other um, challenge that we had is the loss of state funding, not just here, but nationally. When I was in Texas as a university president, when I started in 2007, 72% of my budget came from the state. And when I left that position in 2012, it was 28%. We were able to raise tuition in Texas. Louisiana is going through many of the same budget cuts, but at the same time, tuition is low, and rightly or wrongly, we're not able to raise that tuition much. So there's a gap out there in terms of what we had and what we need. 
And the last thing is alluded to is the budget. So let me talk a little bit about where we are and what we think is going to be happening is that right now uh, I started January 5th at eight o'clock and at 10 o'clock I was given the budget uh, projection. So two hour, two hour honeymoon to take advantage of that. So we've been working with the system presidents, with their CFOs, on creating a list really of, of recommendations that our legislators can, legislators can look at to help us defray or offset this projected budget cut. Because let me put it in perspective. Uh, we're looking at a, a proposed budget dev a cut of $420 million. We have right now a higher education budget of about 720 million after five years of declining uh, budgets. So therefore, that is a budget that is not just trimming at the edges. That really goes to the heart of the ability to, to preserve our institutions and maintain the rigor and quality that we need. So this is not a proposed cut. This would basically gut higher education. So we need to be mindful. We're working with our legislators to give them those recommendations to perhaps to repurpose uh, things that are out there right now toward higher education. Uh, the 27th of February, the budget uh, is uh, basically presented to the governor at that point. That will be a public document at that point in time. I know a lot of people are going to look at that and begin to say, what can we do to help? Well, I spent a lot of time talking with the business community who want our students to come into their corporations, spent a lot of time talking with moms and dads. You are citizens. You have the, the ability to speak to your legislators. And I would urge you, if you feel comfortable doing that, I would urge you to say that higher education is the future of this state. We create, we graduate students, we get jobs, pay taxes, and give back to the community. We need your help to get that message across that these proposed budget cuts uh, do not come to pass. So once again, happy to answer any questions, happy to be here, pleased to be in Louisiana, so thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Commissioner Rallo, for your comments. We appreciate uh, you sharing with us just what's going on in terms of trends of higher education and the effects in Louisiana. And more specifically, your reference to the budget that this is not a budget cut, but rather a gut of higher education in Louisiana. It's quite tragic for us. We have a few questions that we're gonna entertain right now, and some of them are actually budget-related questions. And so we'll feel those to Dr. Mason, Dr. Tarver, as well as you, Dr. Rallo. So let's start with our first question that comes to us from an alum. And her question essentially is, she wants to know, how is the state bracing itself for the significant budget crisis and what buffers specifically has Southern University put in place regarding this news? So I'll turn this over to you, Dr. Mason. Thank you, Robin. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you what I have and then uh, ask Dr. Tarver and Dr. Rallo to supplement. Uh, just to put it in perspective for you, uh, this is for the Southern University system. If we were to have a $400 million budget cut, uh, which is what the governor says he's going to announce in his proposal to the legislature, for us, that would mean over $34 million uh, in less state support. Now, just to put it in perspective, since 2008, 2009, uh, our state appropriations have gone down $46 million, which is 47.5%. Our general fund budget has gone down $23 million, which is 15.4%. Our faculty positions have gone down by 201, which is 27%. And our staff positions have gone, by, gone down by 397, which is 32 percent. So you can see that uh, after all of that, another $34 million of cuts uh, is going to put Southern System in the position of really having to figure out how to maintain its viability. Um, now, to our credit, uh, we've been working on a plan for the last four years. Um, and I think a lot of that will come to uh, fruition uh, under the leadership of, of Dr. Tauber and this new board. Uh, he talked about the uh, joint administration in Baton Rouge, which is an efficiency and a, and a cost-saving measure. We're looking at com combined back office operations, which is an efficiency and cost-saving measure. And then uh, we're going to have to look at our academic programs across the system as a way to not only uh, reduce expenses, but also tie our programs more into the workforce needs of the state, the nation, and the world. Um, so, um, having said that, let, let's just check with uh, Rob and Dr. Tarver and Dr. Rollo, see if they want to add anything to that. We'll start with you, Dr. Tarver, uh, in terms of the board's approach to the impending budget situation here at Southern that we'll be faced with from the governor. Uh, that Dr. Mason has shared, but let me also say that this 
condition that we're facing is one of the most catastrophic in the history of higher education in the years that I've lived here all of my life. And this is not a situation that can be easily buffered. Uh, what it's going to require uh, is a joint effort by all of higher education, the Southern system, the LSU system, uh, the ULL system, the Community Technical College Board system, and of course of the leadership of the Board of Regents uh, to devise strategies and to try to influence the legislature uh, to be uh, more open and of course uh, more creative uh, in addressing the fiscal needs of this state and particularly the fiscal needs of higher education. Uh, this is not a situation we can simply cut ourselves out of. Uh, we can't cut enough to address the, this uh, catastrophe. So it's going to take some creative thinking, uh, new ways of thinking. It may require new partnerships and new arrangements between and among universities and between and among university systems. Uh, and we're going to explore some new ideas in the, in, in the, in the coming days ahead about how that may, how that may happen. Uh, Southern University is concerned not only about Southern University, but it's also concerned about Grambling State University. Uh, and I want to be able to say that to our, to our, our Southernites because we know how important Gremlin is uh, to education in the state and the relationship we have together. We have to step, stand up for Gremlin and we want them to help stand up for us. But I think in joining hands with all of higher education, Dr. Rollo, uh, we can at least begin approaching uh, more realistic uh, terms uh, and begin to get the legislature and the governor on board uh, with higher education. And I think if we're able to demonstrate to the governor, demonstrate to the legislature that we can uh, come up with new ideas and new approaches, utilizing the resources that we have, and with some help from them, we may be able to stem the tide and uh, move forward in a productive way. Thank you, Dr. Tarver, for your comments. We appreciate that. Uh, we're going to now ask Dr. Rollo to respond in the same regard. I know you covered some of those points in your earlier presentation, Dr. Rollo, but if you could offer us a few more specifics. Thank you. I'd be happy to. Well, first off, I agree uh, with, with my colleagues in terms of the, the nature of the, uh, the challenge, but also the nature of the crisis. Let me talk about two words that I've been using with respect to uh, the resolution of these issues. Uh, significant. In other words, when I say significant, as we come up with recommendations to our legislative uh, colleagues, we need to make sure that whatever uh, and however we work through those recommendations, at the end of the day, we're able to offset the proposed cuts, not just nibble at the edges, because this is something that would uh, that needs a major fix, not just something in the range of five or ten or twenty million dollars. It has to be significant. And the other word I use is sustainable. In other words, we need to be thinking not just about this year and a band aid and fixing it. We need to be finding sources of revenue to direct toward higher education, all of higher education within the state of Louisiana, so that every year we don't have these fits and starts as we move forward. I think everyone recognizes that. We are the only area really that is not protected by the Constitution, and so therefore we are susceptible to these cuts if budgets, uh, you know, have have some issues. And so we need to work with our legislative colleagues to be able to define revenue streams to higher ed, so that we have the presence of the systems and the chancellors of the campuses have that certainty against which they can plan. Thank you, Commissioner Rallo. We appreciate those comments. Uh, we have a few more questions that have come in. The first question is, what have we done specifically to improve recruitment of students and the registration process? I'll turn that over to you, Dr. Mason. All right. Um, well, as you know, in this new competitive environment, it's all about enrollment. Uh, the way the governor has restructured the system of financing higher education, uh, we used to get 67% of our uh, uh, resources from state appropriations. Now we get 37%, which means that we are no longer a, a state-supported institution. We are a state-assisted institution. Uh, so for us, it's all about being competitive and, 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 and getting in more students here. Um, you know that we've beefed up our uh, recruitment and enrollment operations. Uh, applications are up. Uh, we've created our College Connect program, which allows us to put our community college both in Baton Rouge and in New Orleans uh, so that students who cannot meet the more rigorous new admission standards can now come to our system through the community college and then seamlessly transfer into the four-year schools. And of course, we have uh, the online college, which started out with uh, no degree programs a few years ago, and now we have six up and running. 
uh, in the long run, I think it's those three pronged approaches, which is uh, traditional classroom enrollment, uh, online enrollment and community college transfers into the four year schools through the Southern University system that will um, enable us to, to not only compete, but also to compete at the highest levels over time. Uh, so it'll take a minute. Uh, you know, en enrollment processing is not an easy thing. Uh, it not only involves recruiting students, but it also processes the applications, financial aid, uh, and then also retaining them once they are here. Uh, a lot of effort is being going into uh, shoring up all of those systems now so that after it's all said and done, uh, we'll be able to compete in what has become a very, very competitive environment. Dr. Mason, we also have another question in that same vein regarding out-of-state fees. We have a student, Benny Brown, who is concerned as a junior here on the Baton Rouge campus that we're waiving out-of-state fees for the incoming students, and we're offering the out-of-state fee scholarships. And he's looking to see what can be done for students who are here already, uh, such like such as himself, I should say, and he's concerned because he's been in Louisiana about four to five years. Yes. Um, well, as you know, we've been expanding the out-of-state out uh, scholarship program, out-of-state fee waiver. Uh, right now, uh, on the Baton Rouge campus, which is our largest campus, uh, not only contiguous states, but also any other state in the nation where a student meets certain uh, academic requirements, uh, they can have their out-of-state fee waived. Now, once they're here, they have to maintain a 2.5 GPA in, or, in order to maintain that waiver. In addition, if you are a uh, life member of the Alumni Association and your child wants to come here, then half of your uh, out-of-state uh, tu uh, tuition is waived, out-of-state fee that is. Um, so while uh, we are mandated by the state to charge uh, out-of-state students the average price for other HBCUs around the country uh, when it comes to out-of-state fees, I think that uh, we're making good progress toward uh, lessening uh, that burden on the out-of-state students. Now, as for your particular situation, uh, you know, I would suggest that you either email me uh, or email uh, the chancellor of the campus, uh, Flanders McClinton, and we can look into your particular situation and see uh, what, what can happen there. Robin? Thanks, Dr. Mason, for that response. I hope that helps you out some. We have another question from Stephanie. Uh, goes sort of back to where we were with the budget situation, Dr. Mason. And Stephanie's question is simply, is there any chance that Southern University may close? Well, I think we're a long way. I think we're a long way from that happening. Uh, first of all, remember uh, this announcement by the governor is uh, his recommendation to the legislature. The chances that uh, his recommendation will actually end up being uh, what the legislature does at the end of the session uh, is probably very slim. Uh, in fact, we've talked to the legislative leadership and uh, you know they've all indicated to us that they just don't see how higher education could take any cut anywhere near uh, what the governor is proposing. And candidly, I think even the governor knows that. Uh, so um, you know, let's not let's not uh, let's not sound the doom and gloom bell just yet. I think these issues are real. Uh, I think the cumulative effect of these cuts are real. Uh, but the Southern system and the units within the system uh, have been uh, you know up against a lot in the past. Uh, this is one in a long list of challenges, and we've always risen in the past to meet them. And while these are great, uh, I'm confident that we'll rise to meet them as well. Uh, Robin, on that particular issue about uh, the challenges to uh, Southern in particular and higher education in terms of campus closures and financial exigency, we might want to touch base with uh, Dr. Tarver because, you know, he's had a lot of experience uh, with the legislative process and Dr. Rollo, uh, because he has a, a breadth of uh, information and insight into what's happening around higher education in the state. Dr. Tarver and Commissioner Rollo, we will certainly love to hear from you. Dr. Tarver first. Yes, um, I believe that uh, Dr. Mason, in his earlier remarks, uh, mentioned uh, that we have a legislative initiative, uh, a team of people uh, including alumni representatives uh, who are coming together and, and their representatives working in the legislature. Together, we've always been successful over the last decades at influencing greater change in favor of growing higher education. And I know that Dr. Rollo is new to this state, but he comes with a lot of veteran experience in dealing with these kinds of things. 
and I believe he's going to bring a fresh new insight uh, into this matter. And with leadership from the Board of Regents and with the other systems, we ought to have a unified front uh, that says to the legislature, says to the governor, this is not just about uh, keeping a school open. It's about growing higher education because the state needs it. Uh, we have to be able to impress upon them how the state suffers if this system or any system closes or any of our campuses close. So there's a, a great investment here. We've got a, a greater job to do in marketing what we what we have. We've got a greater job to do in working with let's with the legislative delegations from all of our communities across this state. And I think together we're going to have a positive, uh, make a positive impact, and we'll get some positive results. So I, I'm encouraged by the possibilities, not discouraged by all of the the, the negatives. Thank you, Dr. Tarver. Now we'll listen to Dr. Rollo. Very first off with uh, both of my colleagues, but let me add another little piece to the puzzle. Um, and when I spoke, for example, uh, Saturday in Alexandria to the combined faculty senates, I also indicated that I believe that we're going to be able to work our way through uh, this, this challenge, this crisis toward a much more sustainable uh, future in higher ed. But I also pointed out, given the trends that I've alluded to and many other trends nationally, that we cannot look the same at the end of this process as we have over the past few years. We, faculty, staff, administration, governance, we need to understand that uh, higher ed, particularly public higher education, is not going to return to the way it was when funds were you're coming from the state at the 70, 75% level. So we need to be looking at avoidance of duplication. We need to be looking at some, uh, you know, identifying institutions that have areas of expertise and other areas and other institutions that don't do things as well. I and mean, even Harvard, not every department is the best in the country. So we need to be willing, as was mentioned before by Dr. Tarver, we need to be working across and within systems toward a common goal. And that's the key. In other words, where we're, all of us are working toward that common goal for the state of Louisiana. All of us don't need to be doing exactly the same thing, but we need to show that we're willing to change, willing to adapt. So that as we work through this legislative uh, and budget challenge and crisis, we come out stronger, but we also come out looking somewhat different. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Rollo. We have another question for Dr. Mason, and it's regarding the SUSPA Connect program. We have an alum who heard you uh, elaborate on the program and how it's operating here on the Baton Rouge campus. They want to specifically know what is being done to retain these students after the first two years uh, that they're here as a SUSLA Connect student. Thank you, Robin, and that is a great question. Um, first of all, let me say that SUSLA Connect is uh, gonna be a winner for the Southern system. Uh, because of the admission standards, because of rising tuition prices, uh, and really, because of state policy to meet many of the worst for workforce needs of these plants that are coming into Louisiana, uh, you're going to see more and more students going into community college. Uh, the Southern system is fortunate that it has its own community college within the system. So that allows us to not reject students who want an historically black college and university experience because they can't get into the four-year schools. We just tell them they're admitted to Susla Connect, uh, and that way they can have a two-year education on a four-year campus, just as if they were admitted to the four-year school. Uh, now, in terms of retention, uh, let me just, just be honest with you. Um, you know, that is something that is going to require more cooperation between the two-year and four-year campuses. Um, you know, institutions of higher learning are what they are, and they each want to do their own thing in their own way. Uh, so blending or marrying a two-year campus and a four-year campus, even if it's within the, within the same system, uh, will take some time. Uh, we're only into the second year of the program, and uh, we've made really good progress. Uh, we're beefing up the admissions and uh, rather the advising and counseling system. Uh, and you're going to see over time more and more of an easier transition uh, from the two-year to the four-year schools because the four-year schools now are starting to uh, accept the two-year students as if they are their own students from the day they walk in the door. Uh, and I think once this uh, cultural cha change takes hold, you'll see that uh, not only will the transfer rates go up from the two-year to the four-year schools, but also the retention and graduation rates will go up for both over the course of the next few years. But I think that was a great question, and you hit uh, one of the key components of the future of Southern and the Southern system on the head, and I'm glad you asked it. Thanks. Back to you, Robin. 
Thank you, Dr. Mason. We do have another question as well coming from our, from another one. The question is our emergency plans as it relates to what we're doing to prepare uh, emergency-wise for our campuses in terms of implementation of emergency plans. Can you respond to that? I can, um, and I can't respond fully because uh, I don't run the campuses, but I have a pretty good idea because I called the chancellor uh, right before this VChat and got uh, some information. On the Baton Rouge campus, which I think is the same as the other campuses, uh, we have an emergency notification system which works by email and by text. Uh, they test it monthly, and um, it uh, is called First Call. Um, it's been upgraded recently, and there was a lot more to this and a lot more fancy uh, stuff involved in the process, but I ran out of time on the phone, uh, so I couldn't get it all in. But rest assured that uh, the emer emergency notification system is in place it's operational and when needed, uh, it will go into action uh, to make sure that our students understand uh, if something is going on that they need to know about. Robin, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Mason, for that uh, in terms of proactive measures as it relates to our emergency preparedness on the campus. Uh, we have another question. This question is for Dr. Tarver. We have an alum who is concerned about your vision for the board during your tenure as chairman, and more specifically, uh, a little bit more on the legislative agenda and advocating for Southern University. Well, let me begin by saying that this board that we have uh, is okay. as well prepared as any board that we've ever had by virtue of their backgrounds, their experiences, their enthusiasm, uh, and their determination to make uh, a mark on history and not only preserving our institution, but in growing it, expanding it, and making it a finer, uh, even better institution. Uh, our strategies for that will be developed along these lines. Uh, first of all, the crisis that we uh, are facing financially uh, dwarfs so many of the other uh, challenges that we face that unless we are able to resolve it amicably, uh, we're not going to be able to get to the other point. So the fiscal crisis is a high priority uh, for us. And in that regard, I mentioned that we have a legislative team in place and great support from our national alumni organization and from our foundation uh, to work with uh, the uh, legislators. Uh, and to work with the governor's office in trying to make some some change, and we realize that that's going to that's a step by step process. Uh, the legislature doesn't convene until April. Uh, it's a uh, short term as far as we're concerned, but they'll end up addressing the fiscal needs uh, effective July one. Uh, aside from that, we're also going to be looking at what Dr. Rollo uh, refers to as a, a, a different look uh, in terms of structure and strategy in terms of resources and in terms of uh, programs. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, the possibility that we need to enter into new relationships uh, between and among schools uh, in certain regions across the state. Uh, in Baton Rouge, for example, where you have our main campus, our, our flagship campus, and you have LSU across town, and you've got Baton Rouge Community College, it seems to me that we've had a very good productive relationship in the past, but I think all of us are going to need to carve out new strategies in our relationships with each other. There are resources at LSU and BRCC uh, that could be very useful for students at Southern University. By the same token, Southern University has programs and has uh, resources that are important there. Uh, Dr. Rallo mentioned the fact that we ought to cut out duplication. That certainly ought to be a top priority because I don't know why we cannot make arrangements that would allow faculty exchanges, that will allow interchange of courses, uh, and at the same time, shared resources in terms of our programs. There are some things that some schools do better than others. We ought to find out what that is and then see what we can do to help grow that potential. Uh, I watched the situation in my years at Harvard uh, where uh, as a student there and later as an administrator, I observed one of the most incredible uh, high education uh, uh, collaborations that I've known. Uh, and it was about 90 universities in the greater Boston area of which seven or eight of the biggest schools had 
formed a confederation uh, to exchange faculty uh, and coursework and programming. And it certainly meant that all of the students in all of those schools uh, had access to uh, equal access to all of those other uh, programs, faculty members, resources as such. And I think it's something that we should explore here in Louisiana, not just in terms of Baton Rouge, but across this state. It may not be possible for every university in the state to enter into such a consortium, but it certainly is possible, Dr. Rallo, for a larger number of our, our, our schools in certain clustered areas to be able to explore such new relationships. And I think in that regard, we can hold down the increased costs of education for the future by utilizing the resources we have uh, among us. Thank you so much, Dr. Tarver. We appreciate that response and we're looking forward to great work from our Board of Supervisors this upcoming year and beyond. We have a few, uh, actually we have a few announcements, but before we get to those, we have one last question that we're going to take and that question is from an alum in Houston, Texas, concerned about the NC2A sanctions that have been levied against the university and what is our plan, what is our response, how will we handle this? Well, um, we've been working uh, very diligently on the NCAA situation. Um, it involves um, accuracy of our student data, uh, and uh, that's a problem that we have, uh, have fixed. Uh, the challenge we've been having is that it seems that uh, for every um, goal the NCAA gives us to meet and we meet it, then they give us another goal. Uh, so that um, right now uh, we are putting together an appeal to the committee uh, that uh, is in charge of this part of uh, the situation. And we expect to, to speak to them sometime in the course of the next couple of weeks. Um, we've done everything we've been asked to do by the NCAA, and uh, we think that it's time for us to come off of this postseason ban. But you know, the NCAA is becoming more and more of a big money school, and the limited resource institutions, not just Southern, but all of the limited resource institutions in the NCAA or seen uh, these types of challenges. So there's a bigger thing going on here that, that we don't have any control over. Uh, but as far as what we can control, we feel like we're doing everything that we can. And we're gonna press this uh, as, as far as we can for the benefit of our student athletes and for the institution as a whole. Robin. Thank you, Dr. Macy. That. that is a very serious subject that many of our alums are definitely concerned about. We do have a few announcements that we'd like to share before we go into our closing. Comments from Dr. Benson, Dr. Tarver, and Dr. Rollo. So before we do that, a few announcements of things that are coming up throughout the Southern System that we want you to be aware of and perhaps participate in. Of course, the first is the Southern University Agricultural Research and Energy Center will be having a 72nd annual livestock show and poultry show, and that's going to be March 5th through the 7th. And that's going to happen at the Maurice Edmund Livestock Arena in Baton Rouge, and that's going to take place right um, just north of the Baton Rouge campus. And we'll be celebrating the 135th anniversary of Southern University. We're excited about that. It's Founders Day. It's March 9th. It'll be on the Baton Rouge campus. A full day of activities are planned. And you can visit the website at subr.edu to get a list of all of those activities that will be going on throughout that day. We also want to remind you that the College of Education and Human Development at SUNO has joined to host the symposium with the National Dyslexia Center at Yale University for a conference on dyslexia. The event will be held at the SUNO Conference Center on Thursday, February the 19th from 6 until 8 p.m. And all of these announcements you can certainly find on our website at sus.edu in case you miss anything that we're mentioning right now. We want to invite you to the Shreveport campus, the Layla Hathaway concert, which will take place on Thursday, the 26th of February at the Scottish Rite Temple on Cotton Street in Shreveport. And the Honors College here on the Baton Rouge campus, that's the Dolores Margaret Richard Spikes Honors College, will be holding its pinning ceremony to introduce the 2014-2015 Honors College freshman class on Friday, February the 20th, and that's going to take place at 6 p.m. in the Cotillion Ballroom. And lastly, we'd like to remind you that Reverend Jeremiah Wright, Pastor Emeritus of the Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, Illinois, will be a guest speaker here at 1130 on Thursday the 19th in the ballroom of the union. The public is indeed invited to attend that event. Those are our announcements, a number of things that are going on. Again, I would encourage you to visit our website at sus.edu or any of the campus websites to get more information on all of the events that we've listed and quite a few more events that are going on throughout this semester. 
We will now start with Dr. Rallo, our Commissioner of Higher Education, to give his closing comments, followed by Dr. Tarver, and closing with Dr. Mason. Again, thank you for the opportunity to join with you tonight. Let me just uh, close by saying really that uh, higher education, public higher education, is really the future uh, of this state. Uh, it goes to the fabric of our society. It goes to civic engagement. It goes to the private good of a higher education, but also it goes toward meeting the business needs of this uh, state which is really, again, goes back to the funding source. So uh, higher education is not just about the individual, it's about all of us. And I would urge each and every person to weigh in on behalf of all the institutions in this state and certainly Southern to help us achieve those goals on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rallo. It really has been a pleasure having you join us this evening here on the bluff of the campus of Southern University. I hope this isn't your first visit and I hope it certainly will not be your last. Uh, we are now turning it over to our chairman of the Board of Supervisors, Dr. Leon Tarver. Of course, thanking him for his presence this evening as well. Dr. Tarver. Well, thank you, Ms. Merrick, and thank you, Dr. Allo, for your presence and your comments. We're looking forward to working with you over the course of the years ahead, uh, as I know Dr. Mason is. But let me say that uh, Southern University is important, not just to this state, but to this nation. When one considers the long history of our institution and the contributions that we've made through the many, many hundreds and thousands of graduates of our institution who literally sweep across this country, making contributions in their communities and to the growth economy of those communities in the state, that means that we've, we've made an investment and we've got to protect that investment. I've often referred to Southern as a treasured institution because of that. And considering the fact that we're also uh, the largest and only historically black university system in the state, it says to me that Louisiana must also help us assist, help assist, assist us in, in getting out the news that there's a high quality product here, that, that there's a, a great school here, and we need to be able to exploit the resources. But when I think about the Nelson Mandela School of Public Policy, and we're the only school in America which has the distinction of having such a great institution named for such an outstanding person. It's no accident that his name uh, is on that building uh, and over this program. It's there because, as I recall him saying when he visited here years ago, when reporters asked Dr. Rallo, uh, Mr. Mandela, why did you come this far to Southern University? And his response was, I came here to honor the work that Southern University is doing in Africa. So our work is not simply confined to the boundaries of Louisiana or the United States, but internationally. And we hope that you can help us as we take this treasured institution and not only protect it and preserve it, but grow it as well. And thank all of you for listening. Those of you who participate and, and make phone calls, spread the news. Talk to your churches, church, your neighbors, your friends uh, about Southern University and about historically black universities, because that's important, too. Thank you very much. Well, we hope you've uh, enjoyed our show tonight, our V-Chat. Uh, let me thank uh, Robin uh, for her usual uh, uh, outstanding uh, emceeing, um, moderating skills. Uh, let me thank Dr. Tarver and Dr. Rallo. Uh, as you can see, uh, both the Southern System and uh, the Board of Regents are in good hands. Um, let me also uh, give you some comfort that, you know, having heard the show tonight, you can see that uh, we have a good team. And this team, uh, the commissioner, the board of supervisors, the other systems in the state of Louisiana, are all working together to meet this challenge that uh, we face today. And I'm confident that uh, the future of Louisiana, uh, which really relies on higher education to produce the jobs and produce the knowledge and produce the teachers that produce the students that produce the jobs and produce the knowledge, uh, is in good hands. Uh, we have a strong team of legislative advisors uh, for Southern. Uh, we're getting help from the 1880 Society uh, to help pay for that. Uh, if you haven't joined the 1880 Society, uh, go to foundation at sus.edu and see how you can, can help. Uh, the Alumni Federation is fully engaged. Uh, if you haven't heard about the letter writing and email campaign, uh, you should get in touch with either Robin Merrick or Preston Castile and see how you can get involved. So once again, thank you for our guest. It was good to see you again. And uh, I'll end this uh, broadcast like I end every broadcast by saying, God bless the Jaguar Nation. See you next time.